Hey everyone, CyberCDH here. Hope you're doing really well. Um, today I'm going to take a look at a sample that was sent to me by one of my followers on Twitter. Uh, so thank you very much for that. I'm really open to suggestions of interesting samples to have a look at. Uh, this one caught my eye because it's um, a, quite a common um, packer that we're going to have a look at. Uh, but then also uh, there's some nifty little tricks here that the malware uses to disguise itself. Um, and the first being that this malware is actually password protected uh, and we don't know what the password is. Uh, we've just got the original binary uh, and we need to get past that in order to find out uh, what the malicious behavior is and what this malware is designed to do. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, we're gonna have a look here. I've got the malware on my virtual machine here. Um, and there's a few things I like to do first when I, I look at any malware. Um, so the first is I really like PStudio. Um, so the EXE I put into PStudio, it's a great tool is for, for malware initial assessment. Um, gives you all the kind of uh, basic IOCs, imp hash, uh, MD5 hash, etc. Um, but also it gives you some signature stuff as well. So you can see straight away the signature is uh, UPX. Uh, which is indicative that this uh, particular sample is packed with uh, UPX. Uh, and UPX is a really common packer. Um, it's only because it's readily available, uh, free to use, um, and it provides a layer of uh, protection uh, that's easy to bypass, but um, a layer nonetheless that, uh, that might thwart some security controls. You can see as well, I do also have a look at is the virus total output here. Uh, and I, I look initially to see if I can recognize any of the naming conventions um, and anything of interest. So I've not even ran the malware yet, but already I can see there's a couple of references. I mean, there's a lot of generic stuff in here, uh, but there's this bat disabler. I uh, thought that was quite interesting. Uh, I also see malware.bat, um, and there's probably one or two other similar um, uh, attributions there as well. If you wanted to, you can look at the strings. Not too much use to us here because uh, it's packed with UPX, but I do like to pay attention to the resources uh, section as well, uh, just to see what resources the malware has uh, built into it uh, because it likely if it has some then it's going to refer to them uh, and they may they're usually a very common place for malware to hide stuff um, outside of the uh, the actual code uh, so you can see here there's a number of resources if we ignore the manifest that's uh, irrelevant to us here uh, but these other resources you can see the file ratio so instantly this one um, I'm drawn to this one because it's quite chunky uh, 26 kilobytes uh, and we can also see what I do like about this uh, malware initial assessment tool, PStudio, is the entropy as well. So it gives you a rating of whether or not it thinks this uh, particular resource may be uh, encrypted or packed or what have you in, in, in some kind of way. Um, gives you a flavor for are you dealing with uh, some kind of encryption. Here, these entropy scores are quite high, certainly in the sixes and sevens are high. Uh, so that would that would um, indicate to me there's some, some degree of encryption that's gone on. Uh, or compression. Um, so that's that. Um, next up, what we want to do is um, let's take, take a look and run the malware and see what happens. So the first thing I'm going to do here is just run pro process monitor uh, and I'm going to have a look at where the operation is um, process create um, and just apply that to my filter. That will get nice and running. If I run the malware, uh, you can see that I get this password prompt don't know what the password is at this stage so type in anything and I get wrong password uh, and away we go the malware kills uh, and there's no other processes which are created uh, and if you wanted to adjust the filters you could do and you'd find that the malware doesn't do anything else either um, so okay that's um, leads us to our next stage firstly we want to get through the UPX packer uh, a couple of ways we can do that um, firstly is the hard way um, and so like any uh, malware analysis uh, you may have to use different methods in different environments so it's always worth knowing a couple of different ways to unpack malware uh, whether this is UPX or some other method you might find a, a packer which uses a similar routine here um, uh, probably three or four different ways you can unpack it and we'll show you a couple of basic ways um, all of this assembly code here is not the malware uh, this is all the, the UPX unpacking stub uh, the routine that's going to be used to to unpack the malware um, and one of the um, heuristics you can look for is really just to eyeball the code uh, and look for what's called a tail jump uh, and a tail jump is a jump 
uh, that, that moves from one uh, location in, into another location that's quite far away uh, from the existing memory location. Uh, and what I'll give you an example of that here. So if I scroll down, you can see I've actually already set a breakpoint on it. Um, if I scroll down here, here's the, the, the tail jump. And it's usually the reason why it's called tail is because it's towards the end of the code, um, as in it would be towards the end of the unpacking routine. Um, and it's going to hopefully jump to the, the unpacked code um, once it's finished with the unpacking stop. Um, and it's going to jump to a, a location here, uh, an offset which is quite far away from the current memory instruction. Uh, like well, the instruction location so you can see where we are in memory here and give you a comparison if i just find another jump uh, if i can find one scroll up a little bit where are we here we go i saw one where are we jmp somewhere um or even a JNE, what have you, it doesn't really make any difference. Uh, any kind, that's a conditional jump. Um, but you can see here, this one just moves a couple of instructions back, might be some uh, some kind of loop. Here's an unconditional jump. Um, so again, moves a couple of instructions forward. So usually that's what happens in the, with the compiler. Um, you know, it, it, the, the code compiles and places things uh, in, in relative order, are quite close together when you're jumping around. And it's quite unusual to jump to a location that's so far away from your current instruction. So what you could do is uh, you could run the malware. It's going to break point because I've set that on this particular tail jump. If you press enter now, uh, this code here is actually the, hopefully the unpacked code. Um, uh, and so what you could then do is use some plugins uh, built into X32 or X64 to actually dump this process out. Um, a much easier way of unpacking it and actually probably a lot cleaner, uh, if I'm honest, is to actually use UPX itself. Um, and so um, UPX can be used to obviously pack the code, but UPX has a dash D flag on it, which can be used to unpack the code as well. So we use uh, dash D to decompile it, and we'll just, uh, oops, do dash O for uh, output.exe. Um, so we get a new binary output.exe. You can see it's almost twice the size. Uh, and we could do the same thing. I start the process again, put it back into PE Studio gives you all of the initial assessment. You can see here, this time the signature suggests that this has been uh, encoded with pure basic, uh, which is something I've not seen an awful lot of, I'll be honest with you, uh, but I won't let that put me off. Um, you can see the virus total um, output here as well. So again, we see bat disabler, suspicious unsafe bat disabler, rand bat. So a lot of, a lot of references to bat files here, which um, may, uh, may prove interesting going forward section table as well has been rebuilt uh, we can see the imports um, and we can poke around those if we needed to um, and then also strings is usually of interest as well um, we'll come back to resources in just a second we did see the resource in fact we'll do that now we we did see the resources earlier um, but if you noticed um, let's just do a quick view on on both of these together perhaps uh, side by side so if you have a look at this resource um, and this resource here uh, view you can see if you look at the first few bytes of each one of them uh, they're different and because remember this is the original that's packed with UPX um, so um, no, no real use to us here um, so so that's cool so we know that um, it's got some resources we, we saw that they were high entropy um, and one thing that really stands out to me and hopefully something you can take away here from um, from, from this this video um, is to learn some magic bytes, some magic byte headers that, that kind of like stick out at you when you recognize them. And whenever I see um, these two bytes here, 789C, uh, and it's easily recognizable in a ASCII dump because it's the lowercase letter X, or 78 is lowercase X, um, then 789C uh, usually equates to uh, something called Zlib, uh, which is a compression algorithm. Um, which um, is indicative of something at play here. And we'll come back to that in just a second. Before we do, let's dive into strings because now that we've got an unpacked binary, we might get something interesting out of the strings. And there's quite a lot here uh, to go through. Uh, and so I tend to just kind of eyeball stuff based on size. So I order it by the stuff, you know, the lengthiest strings, and I see if there's anything uh, of particular interest. You can see here as well, uh, just a few uh, rows down here. Uh, this is inflate 1.2.8 copyright Mark Adler. Uh, and so if we were to Google that, let's have a look here. Um, 
1.2.8 Mark Adler. Um, we can see that there's references to Zlib, Zlib home site, Zlib Symantec, whatever, whatever. So this looks like something again to do with Zlib. So we saw before the magic uh, file header byte, this um, uh, 78.9C. Um, and so again, indicative that uh, there's some kind of Zlib compression. Other strings as well, um, which may may kind of help point you in the right direction. Uh, so definitely worth spending some time going through what's what's available here. Um, okay, so I, I, I know that these resources um, are potentially um, compressed. I know this one is, is certainly of interest here. Uh, and so what I'm going to dump it out uh, into my downloads folder, I'll call this resource.bin uh, for now. Uh, and we're going to hopefully uh, decompress that using Zlib. So to allow it use for that, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of already before I'm getting into the malware, I really want to see what's in this resource. My tool of choice here would be Cyberchef. Um, so what we can do is load up the, the, uh, the resource here, the input file into Cyberchef. Let's go to my downloads, my resource here, uh, and we can use uh, Zlib deflate. Um, and we can see that hopefully, maybe I need to do, whoops, from hex. Um, oh, I beg your pardon. No, I don't, stupid. What I need to do is zlib inflate because it's already deflated. So I need to inflate it back up again. Here we go. Um, and then we just remove the null bytes uh, to get rid of those. And we can see here, we've got password prompt. Please enter the correct password, wrong password. And we've got this weird hash here. Um, and what we can also do in Cyberchef, let's get rid of this recipe here, is we can say, uh, analyze the hash. So you give it a hash and it will work out, well, it's 32 characters, 16 bytes, 128 bits. Therefore, it could be MD5, it could be MD4, um, etc. Chances are it's MD5, that's probably the more common. Um, and so what we can actually do is we can Google this, my favorite open source intelligence tool. Um, and we can see here that there are, this hash um, has already been decoded and we can see that it's decodes to the string Boris. So, you know, nothing really too technical about that, but let's, um, let's open up Procmon again. Let's run the malware again and let's just try the string Boris. And lo and behold, we now have our malware executing. Uh, which is good and we've got a lot of stuff going on in uh, in process monitor so that's good but what we want to get to though is the um the original code the malicious code that that spawned all of this uh we, we've got some great indicators now that we can pull out of um of process monitor we can see all of the stuff it's doing there's loads of stuff loads of processes loads of um, commands it's running task kill task kill task kill all over it looks like it's just stopping um, loads of different uh, processes and services um, and we'll and we can dive into that in a bit more detail if needed so what, what I like to do first um, is we had a look at the strings we know there was zlib um, uh, headers and indicators and stuff like that but if we run the malware in, a, in our debugger let's switch over here to um, x32 dbg uh, and i'm just going to run the malware in fact let me show you this first so if i search for in the current module all of the strings we can see that when i load the malware there's not many strings in memory um, and nothing really of interest to me at the moment uh, but if i run uh, and then we we're at this point here um, where the malware is executed we've gone however many instructions past where the entry point is and we're at this password prompt if i do the same thing again now so if I search for string references, you can see I've got a lot more strings and that's because um, it seems to have unpacked or decoded stuff in memory. Uh, and we've now got access to, a, to a, a bit more of a playground. And some of the stuff that sticks out at me, well, firstly, this hash uh, sticks out at me uh, and I'll save you the pain. I Googled it and I can't work out what it is. And I, I'm not really sure what it relates to, if I'm honest with you. But um, again, don't let that deter you. Uh, you don't need to understand every single instruction in this malware uh, to work out what it does. Uh, but a few things that did stick out to me was this uh, these two here uh, so this b2e ink file and b2e ink file count uh, so again let's use our best open source intelligence tool b2e ink file count and we can see here 
that that term exists in the documentation for bat to exe um, which again is indicative of the tool which the the bad guys may have used here uh, in order to generate the executable so we've got bat to exe program description converts batch files bat scripts into exe format um, so that's cool and you've got a whole a host of options here and look at this as well you can even compress the exe with upx and lo and behold that's what we saw as well so i'm smelling it now as a malware analyst i'm thinking to myself i, I i've got the tool that the bad guys likely used uh, to generate this executable and you can see here that uh, it gives you a load of commands on the command line um, to make it invisible um, use a temp directory uh, encrypt it with a password again something that we saw um etc etc uh, and also as well there's options to to decompile it so to convert the exe back to a back file um which is great because that means that hopefully we can strip out all of the exe stuff that we don't really want to reverse engineer and we can get the original code uh, but no doubt we'll need the password but guess what we already cracked it um so if we scroll right the way down here you can see that the website where this came from f2ko.de uh, which is in in german jawohl um, and so we have here the link to bat to exe converter uh, which i've already downloaded quite handily here so if you run it there's uh, portable versions which i ran so if you run the portable version you get this nice little GUI here um, and this is for where you're going to uh, put your bat file and then uh, select all of those options to generate uh, an executable file uh, and in our case we actually want to do the opposite so if we go to tools we can see exe to bat so let's go back to our downloader let's go to the original uh, we're going to go open enter the password uh, and then it say where do you want to save it to well i don't know let's save it to the desktop uh, and then let's see what's on my desktop uh, and lo and behold here we've got this bat file called dell.bat and if we edit that We've got the colors that we saw in our terminal window, and we've got all of the tasks, the net stop commands that this malware was executing. So now we've managed to get ourselves the original code that the bad guy used, and all we had to do was Google for an MD5 hash. So pretty simple, really. Sometimes you don't have to reverse engineer every single line of code and understand everything that the malware does to get you to the indicators that you need. So. Hopefully that's of use to you. I had some fun looking at the sample, so thanks again for sending it over to me. I'm always taking uh, suggestions of interesting samples. I've got a lot to work through, but if you do see something of interest in the wild uh, that you want me to take a look at, feel free to send it over. Thanks very much. Bye.